We're fresh out of Twitter jail. We're rolling out the red carpet. Mitch, are you ready for Best in the West Awards for the 2022 football season? Yeah, our, our third annual uh, award show here. So excited to look back at some great performances by players, teams, coaches. Yeah, let's get into it. I would say it's the most wonderful time of the, but I, I better I better not go no, there. No, no, no. Can't go there. Nope. Talking Illinois high school football. If your goals are as high as you talk about, tonight, tonight, you go out and just take one more step. It's a view from the West. And it starts right now. Welcome back to View from the West podcast. I'm your host, Greg Armstrong, joined as always by Mitch Stormer. Mitch, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Oh, no, I can't say no. that. We can't no, say sure. that. No, you sure can't. You, sure, you <laughs> certainly can't use it as an audio clip. No, on, no. On, on everyone's favorite, our most shared, most liked <laughs> video two years running. Uh, so, so yeah, be careful with what you say around these parts now. Let's give the listeners, the followers of View from the West, a little insight here. Mitch, we were put in Twitter jail this week. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I just I opened my my Twitter account and I just I happened to be on my personal account. I wasn't even on ours, and I, I got an alert that our account was locked uh, for I, I don't even remember what it said, but. I, I screenshot it and sent it to you, and, and you dug into it, and it turns out the fun police were, uh, were on full patrol. Yeah, so as uh, some may remember, uh, the past couple years, it's kind of been an annual tradition the last couple years, yeah. that right around playoff time, the playoff pairings are announced, and I would put together a little highlight reel, a little montage of the best plays of the year, and set it to, set it to video, the video set to the audio of Andy Williams singing It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Now, I will, I will openly admit that we did not contact the Andy Williams estate and ask for direct permission to use it for this high school football montage. Somehow they found us, Mitch, and I was alerted with a letter saying, Dear Sir or Madam, I am contacting you on behalf of the International Federation of Phonographic Industry. So, mm. so they, were coming, yeah. they were coming to get us. The rest of the letter reads that basically... We don't think you have permission to use that song, so it's going to be deleted or your account suspended. So I played nice. We deleted it. They're all gone now. So unfortunately, to anyone who enjoyed that, it, it is no longer available in the digital world. So and just again, the fun police, full patrol coming after you from the West podcast. But you know what? That's what happens to the big guys. So I guess we're we're up there. I think that means we're being noticed, Mitch. So that's good. Yeah. You know what? It, it's It's good news, bad news, I suppose. So. Yeah, uh, I fully anticipate us to remake that video in some way, shape, or, or fashion. Um, because, yeah, I look forward to that video every single year. So uh, rest assured to the, the listeners out there, we'll, we'll think of something. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a new version out. Yeah, well, thank you to everyone who supports us, who has supported us all year. Thank you to everyone who follows us on Twitter. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere on Twitter. We're, we're back. We're up there. We're ready to rock and roll. But Mitch, are you ready to rock and roll? For the awards episode, the best in the West. It's our third annual. Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to do. Here's the breakdown. We're going to give our game of the year from our listening area. We're going to give our coaches of the year. So one from each conference and the three rivers conference will give two awards because their conference is big and split into two divisions. Mm -hmm. We'll do a defense of the year, a defensive team of the year. So one overall for everybody in our area. We'll do a team of the year from 11 man and from eight man. So we'll make sure to give, give love to both sides of the, uh, both sides of our coverage there. And then this is when it gets good player of the year. So one from each conference, again, the track will get one for the East and one for the West or the rock and the Mississippi, depending on where your, you know, true allegiances lie and how you want to phrase it. And then we will go with our view from the West player of the year. That's our overall award. We will deviate this year and give one to the 11-man player of the year and one to the eight-man player of the year. So, Mitch, it's like, it's our version of the Heisman Trophy, but we don't have a name for it. We need to, we still have not come up with a name for our version of the Heisman. Yeah, when I was going to say, you know, congratulations to the winners that we'll announce and your prize is simply a mention on Goof from the West podcast. So we might have to, you know, uh, 
I have to think of something different to do there. Um, we'll, we'll give him a, we'll give him maybe like a tweet, but we probably won't be able to set it to music. <laughs> we'll go set it to music. We won't be able to use uh, pictures from anywhere. So maybe I'll, I'll draw it and paint or something, you know, and we'll just have a, we'll just have a little clippy art type of thing. But you know what? We'll think of something. If I got video of them, I can certainly, we can certainly use that. How about that? Right. Yep. That'll work. All right. Well, without any further ado, let's get right into it. Mm -hmm. So the nominees for our game of the year, Sterling over Quincy in the regular season, 34-28 in overtime. Mitch, that was a thrilling finish in that one. Coming down to the wire, Quin or Sterling getting the big win on the road. Yep. We'll go with Dakota over Forreston, 34, another 34-28. This one in regulation, but it came down to the wire. And at the time, and even at the end of the year, it really felt like that was a critical win for this Dakota team that it had some struggles in recent years, but that really seemed like a defining moment for that program. Mm -hmm. You have Moline falling just short to Yorkville, 34-31 in four overtimes. Yorkville had kicked a field goal on the opposite end, on the opposite possession. Moline got down to, I believe, a third and one and was stopped, and they went for it on a fourth and one and came mm -hmm. up inches inches short it was a gutsy call we agreed at the time that you got to go for it in that situation yep. they yep. put the ball in the hands of their best player yep. and it just fell one yard short it's a heartbreaker for the team from our area but it certainly was a game we would not forget in this in this football season we also had sterling newman over spring valley hall 20 to 18, another game that came down to the final play of regulation. That was Newman getting a touchdown pass as time expired. Thrilling game. I remember seeing the video of that one after it completed. That was a big win for Newman to kind of keep their playoff track in line. And the game, another, our last nominee, West Central over Polo in the eight man semifinals. Mitch, this game was wild. Marcos, the Polo Marcos, scored on a touchdown with 42 seconds left to take a lead in the game. Now, keep in mind, this is a semifinals. State championship is on, a trip to the state title is on the line here. They yep. score with 42 seconds left. West Central answers with a score at the final buzzer to pull out a 50-48 to 48 victory. It was a pitch, a pitch play to tailback, tailback Caden Drosty. He fights into the end zone. It was just a crazy game, a, you know, almost bizarre finish when you're running the ball from that mm -hmm. end, from that area in the field. But eight-man football plays a little bit different, and man, Kate Drosty was a kid that was not going to be denied. So anyway, those are our nominees. Mitch, I'll start with you. We'll bounce back and forth. I'll start with you. Where does your head go on best game of the year from our area? Yeah, well, let me let me just touch real quick on each of these two. Um, obviously, we talk about that Sterling Quincy game, right? That was a game that we kind of highlighted early on as two teams that we thought were going to be competing near the top of the Western Big Six, and that was about middle of the season. I, I cannot remember what the records were at the time, but uh, we knew it was going to be a good game. Came down to the, to the final, uh, uh, or I should say, came down into overtime. Sterling gets that that one you know, score victory there. Great game. Um, Well-deserved to be here in this final list. As you mentioned, not much to add there on the Dakota over Forreston game. That was really that game that Dakota hadn't looked good prior to the, prior to that game. And Forreston had looked really good. Dakota gets the win, kind of turns their season around a little bit. They get into the playoffs. Forreston does too. So yeah, this was a great game in the, in the NUIC. Moline to Yorkville, as you mentioned, you said it all. It was I, I was watching this game. I think you were, you might've been covering a game that night. Um, I did I watched, catch the end of it. And then I yeah. caught up like hearing it from you and right. yeah. yeah. I watched it from, from kickoff to final whistle. So um, as you mentioned, a great game between two seven, eight teams came down to the final second. You, you, you got to put the ball in the hands of your best player. Moline did that nine out of 10 times. You're going to score. This was that one time they didn't excellent game between the Foxes and the Maroons there. Uh, Newman, again, last second, can't beat that. Great play by J.J. Castle to beat Hall, a playoff team in Hall. Uh, but saving the best for last, I, I think we might agree on this one. The way that that West Central game ended, 
with what was on the line. Two really, really good teams in eight, man. Um, I think we do have video of this, Greg. So this could be a video we could share. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen the play play there yet, because like you said, it's it was amazing that you called that play in that in that time of the game, right? From where they were on the field, it's just a, it's a simple halfback toss, and it's yeah. a, it's a key, it's a key play that Heat ran all year. And certainly, when you have a player like like Drosty, it's going to work out. But just calling that play in in that setting was was a great call. The the run, the broken tackles was was really really amazing. And then just to, again, it sent them to uh, the state championship and eventually led them to a state title. So uh, my vote, I think it is yours too. Game of the year here goes to West Central over Polo in that state semifinal. Yeah, that's the game that stood out to me as it was the most, it just seemed like it got the most reaction in, you know, right away on Twitter. You were seeing it everywhere. Everybody was sharing that video. Everybody's talking about that play. That to me, yep, that's that's my game of the year. I want to say that um, head coach Jason Kirby said that the I think the players, you know, kind of called that play or maybe he agreed with the call, trusting in his players, but I think it was kind of a player-led thing. And then I also heard that Drosty almost ran out of bounds thinking that he had time to get one more play in and then realized it wasn't going to happen. So he almost just like, I don't know, he mentioned like, I just kind of closed my eyes and just 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 went for it. Yeah, Yeah, which is insane. You know, that just, it kind of proves like just the heart of a champion. And and I know that's cliche, but just that, that grit and that will and that, you know, determination in the end, it was, it was fun. It was cool to see and it capped off an amazing season for him, you know, or they were about about to cap off an amazing season. Yeah. One of his 175 touchdowns that he had (laughs) this year. uh, Probably the most notable for sure. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that for sure. So there you go. Our best game of the year, the game of the year from the West, from the view from the West podcast, West central over Polo in the eight man semifinals, Mitch, let's get into coaches of the year. We'll go one from each conference. We'll start, start up top with the big conference, the Western Big Six. We got to start with Mike Morrissey and Moline. Uh, you know, just another great year for the Maroons. They, they get back into the driver's seat in the Western Big Six, winning the conference championship. We talked about a gutsy performance against Yorkville, falling an inch short of what would have been Moline football history in advancing out of the, semi, or out of the uh, second round. But either way, what a year for this Moline team that, you know, you go back to when we started this podcast and they were down a little bit. They were a younger team in that COVID year. And then they built up the year after that. And Matthew Bailey really stepped onto the scene and let them. And then this year it was like one more step in that process. I've really been impressed with what coach Mike Morrissey has done with this Moline program. Yeah. Uh, you said it all there. This was, this was a great year for Moline, a team that we thought, well, let me, let me, Backtrack team that I thought was going to okay, win they, the yeah, okay. Big Six early on in the year, and, and they proved me to be right. You know, uh, in the regular season, only a three point loss in week two uh, to Bennett, and after that, they were they were really in cruise control. Um, certainly came down to it came down to week eight, right when they played Sterling, um, and came away with a thirty three to twenty one to victory there. And as we talked about, a, a crushing loss in the playoffs, but yeah. A, a, a terrific program there in in Moline. If you, if you remember, Greg, they lost a lot of offensive production from last year, replacing the quarterback, replacing Matthew Bailey at receiver, and they just reloaded and had maybe even a better team than they did the year before. So, um, yeah, this was a really, really great year for, for Mike Morrissey, and I, I anticipate him and, and even the other finalists here, we're going to be talking about them year after year as long as they uh, remain as head coaches. Yep, let's move down the list. Another nominee for Coach of the Year in the Western Big Six, John Schlemmer. He's been on our list, I think, the last couple years in in this award show, and for good reason. Sterling is always playing at a high level. They once again were playing at a high level in the Western Big Six. They fall short to Moline, but other than that, a really solid season. And it just seems like year in and year out, there's new names, there's new talent, and they're put in a system that that works and Moline continue or Sterling continues to produce. Yeah. And another, uh, you know, great season for Sterling in the postseason, right? They, they get two wins. Uh, they beat uh, St. Vider in the first round, big win over uh, the stem, good stem. 
um, in the <laughs> yep. second round yep. before before falling to a really good Sycamore team. So yeah, this was a, a really really fun team to watch. Maybe maybe the most fun team to watch. I, I would I would put out there the way that their offense ran, uh, so many different weapons, so many different formations and options that they could have. Defense played really really well this year. So um, again, just like Moline, a, another year, another great season uh, for Sterling here, and a great job by Coach Slimmer. Yep. Our last nominee for Western Big Six Coach of the Year, Rick Little in Quincy. Mitch, this was a team that we knew had talent, but we also knew they were young and maybe a year away. But there were times this season, and we talked about it, they only fell a touchdown short against Sterling in overtime. This was a team that at times this year showed that they're right there. They're ready to compete for a Western Big Six crown. I give big credit to Rick Little. And obviously his son, Braden, stepping in at quarterback and really making a name for himself was a big part of that. But um, great job by Coach Little and his staff. Yeah, I think I think this year for Quincy was a was I don't want to say it was a building year, but I think it was more of a foundational year because I think I'll put it out there right now. Quincy, I think, will be my favorite in the preseason to win the Western Big Six in 2023. Oh, man, uh, there's there's a bunch of bulletin board material you just gave out to all those other teams. I know. No, I get it. Uh, but with what they bring back, the production that they had this year with how young they were, um, you know, they, they lose Gregory Quince, but with with Little and Rice coming back in the backfield, that's that's a pretty good one-two punch for anybody. So, um, yeah, Coach Little did a great job. Uh, obviously, they get they, they had a great playoff win in round one um, over, what was that, Glenwood, I think. Yeah, right? Yep. Um, yeah. And before falling to a really, really good Lamont team, and that was an unfortunate, unfortunate timing for that game. Weather was bad. It was real windy. Kind of yeah. just hurt the offense. But um, still, only only lost uh, by two scores. But yeah, great great season for Quincy and for Coach Little. Yep. So there you have it. Head coach Rick Little, Mike Morrissey, and John Schlemmer are your nominees for Western Big Six Coach of the Year. Mitch, I'll start and. Rick Little is one that it stands out to me because a lot of times when I look at the coach of the year award, it's to me about that turnaround or right. Or where have we seen improvements that maybe stand out to us as maybe unexpected a little bit. And in this case, that's the one that stands out to me. But I think at the end of the day, I got to stick with the champions of the conference. I got to give it to Mike Morrissey and Moline. What are what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I'm going. I'm going the same here with, with Coach Morrissey. Um, and, and as I said earlier, just what this team had to replace from last year, um, a, a lot of production there, right? Um, and to have the the results that they did, the offense that they did, you know, th that offensive line was so good all year. They they had so many good performances running the ball um, with you know Grant Sibley with Riley Fuller. Um, really, really fun team to watch. This was a great job by the team, by Coach Morrissey. And yeah, I agree with you. That would be my selection here for uh, for View from the West, Western Big Six Coach of the Year. All right, there we go. Let's pencil it in. Mike Morrissey bringing home some hardware there as the Coach of the Year in the Western Big Six, according to the View from the West podcast. Right. Let's get into the Three Rivers Athletic Conference. Mitch, will start on the east side with the uh, – Princeton Tigers, Ryan Pearson as a nominee for head coach of the year in the track Eastern side of the conference. What else can you say? I mean, what Ryan Pearson has done, what he continues to do, he puts Princeton in a spot where they're a threat every year to win the track. And more so than that, they're a team that's known statewide, right? I mean, you listen to the podcast with Edgy Tim or with the Seuss, they're talking about Princeton in the 3A, 4A mix every year now. There, there's no question. So I think that's a compliment to Ryan Pearson because, you know, you go back six to 10 years ago, Princeton was not on the map in football. You know, Jesse Snyder brought him there into the playoffs when he took over. And then when he left and, and Pearson stepped in, it, it's, it's a great fit. And, I, you know, once again, this year, they were a dominant team, maybe more so than they had been in the last couple of years. They were a dominating team. Yeah, and I, I if correct me if I'm wrong, I think Pearson broke the Princeton record for most wins as a head coach this year. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think that sounds right. Yep. And five or six straight conference championships. So yeah, it, it, and um, 
certainly talent wise, one of the best teams that we have had the, the pleasure of covering uh, in a long time, certainly in the history of this, of this, of this podcast. Um, but again, as you said, it's another year. It's another great season for Princeton long run through the three a playoffs, a gauntlet of a, of a, of a class this year um, falling just short to the, the eventual state champions. So uh, yeah, once again, a great, great year out there in Princeton. So another nominee for track coach of the year on that Eastern side, let's go with Randy Teeman from spring Valley hall. This, mm-hmm. this was a team that was two and seven a year ago and he steps in, he returns as head coach. He has Mac Resetich there as a weapon and man, he, he found a way to utilize him all over the field sure. and it did, you know, did so much damage leads a spring Valley hall program back to the playoffs. That to me is a great effort. That's, that's worthy of a nomination to, for coach of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And then Tiemann's first year back is as head coach there at Spring Valley Hall. And, and you see the type of influence that he had. Um, interested to see how they look. And he'll have his hands full, you know, going forward to this, this upcoming year. Um, it, but certainly a great opportunity for Hall to continue to build on the success, success that they had this past season. So, yeah, Coach Tiemann, this is a great job uh, and, and worthy of a nomination here in this category. Yep. Our third nominee on this side of the division in the track, let's go with Jim Eustace from St. Bede. Not a track member for very much longer, but another yep. great year for the St. Bede Bruins. And, I mean, they had they had John Brady at quarterback, and they were winning a lot of football games and looking really good. Yeah, you, you said it. Um, you, help me out here, Greg. Who was, who was their, their star running back last year? Uh, Tyreek uh, Fortney. Yeah, that's right. So losing him, certainly. Yep. Um, was a hurdle to overcome, but the way that that coach Eustace had John Brady ready to play, that defense played really well all year. Um, certainly getting them into the playoffs. This was a, this was a great year too for the for the Bruins, um, and, and three really good candidates here on this side of the conference. Yep. So Mitch, it's your turn. You start uh, this go. Where 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 are you thinking here? Uh, well, I'm gonna go straight to the point. I, I think it's Coach Pearson. Um, Certainly, giving giving a lot of credit to Coach Teeman and, and Coach Eustace for what they did at, at Hall and St. B. But uh, Coach Pearson and that Princeton team once again one of the best teams in three A. I think that that quarterfinal with ICCP was the state championship. Really, I mean that was that was a great game. That that was probably just outside the list of games of the year. Um, yep. And again, that gauntlet that 3A was this year, um, you know, they get past, you know, Kingston in, in, in the playoffs, um, you know, get through the regular season for their, again, fifth or sixth straight conference championship in that, in that division. So, yeah, Coach Pearson, once again, I'm, I'm pretty sure he won this last year uh, on this show. So uh, very well deserved to give it to him again. Yep, I agree. Let's go with Ryan Pearson as our Three Rivers Athletic Conference Coach of the Year on the eastern side of the division or of the conference let's move into the western side of the conference here the western side the western division we'll start with steve schneider from morrison your morrison mustangs mitch this was a revival year for them they were two and seven a year ago they fight back this year with a lot of young talent yeah and they and they make a playoff run they make it to the playoffs yeah, I think this Morrison team only had four seniors on it. So this is this is a team, and, and included some freshmen that played varsity. So this is a team that I think is really going to make leaps and bounds improvements next year and the year after that. I expect Morrison to get back into that into that race for the division crown, uh, back to where they they have been in years past. So yeah, uh, Coach Schneider coming in, uh, bringing his philosophy, bringing his style from Orangeville, uh, really worked wonders here. In, in, in his first full year, right? You know, he, he came in, um, I think, in the summer the year before. Didn't really have a whole lot of prep time or, or as much prep time as you would like going into your first season. Um, so in here, his second year, really first full year, this is a great job. And as I said, I think it's a building block year to move forward. Yep. I would agree with that. The other nominee on this side of the division, Sam Graves from Rock Ridge. Sam Graves had a lot of talent on this Rock Ridge team, and he made it work, led him all the way to the quarterfinals. 
dealt with some injuries this year. John Bain at quarterback went down. Connor Dean stepped in. We'll talk about that later in the episode, I'm sure. But just really impressed with the way he led this team and kind of battled through the adversity. You, you know, you lose some players, some key players in key positions, and this Rocket team kept rolling all the way to the quarterfinals. Yeah, and really when when you look back, they played Princeton week one, yep. right? And I think that was Princeton's closest game, and it was still 19 points. But Yeah, but they played, think, them, they played them well for a half, which yeah. was and impressive think, in itself. Right, and I think right after that, I think we looked ahead at Rock Ridge's schedule and thought that they could win out, and they did. Yeah. Um, and really impressively, I mean, they they put up, you know, over 35 points five different games this year. So, yep. um, yeah, this this was a really good season, uh, certainly coming off last year when they were they were five and five, including that playoff loss in the first round to, I think that was Tri-Valley Downs, right? Yep. Um, and then, as you mentioned, making a run in the two-way playoffs, eventually falling. Sam Graves, great job here. Looking forward to what Rock Ridge is going to be able to do next year. But uh, for, for, this, for this show, for these awards, this was a great, uh, a great season for Rock Ridge. So I think my turn to start here, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Sam Graves and Rock Ridge. Okay. Because I think that, you know, like we said, there was a lot of talent the year before and they gave up a lot of points on defense and they ended up as a, a five and four team and got into the playoffs but, you know, really kind of put themselves behind the eight ball against a really good Downs Tri-Valley team. This year, mm -hmm. they're able to get the job done consistently in the regular season. And what really impressed me was the 27-18 win in the second round over Bloomington Central Catholic. Yeah. I just felt like that Bloomington Central Catholic team had been battle-tested from a really tough conference where they played a lot of bigger schools. And they showed up in this two-way field. And everybody kind of wondered what they were all about. And Rock Ridge really played well against them on the road and got the job done. To me, that pushes Sam Graves into the coach of the year spot. Okay. I'm going to agree with you on this one too, but close. Really, yep. really close. Yep. Um, and, and again, I, I think that this will be, I, I think this could be Coach Schneider's award next season. Um, yep. But, but yep. looking back, I, I think just if, if you, if Morrison would have, won that game against Kiwani. It was a two-point loss. If they wouldn't have given up that last-second touchdown to Sherrard, if you remember that, right? Yep, yep. Um, they really, I mean, they had 55 against Orion. They had 56 against Leroy. They showed a lot of signs of, of progress. This was an excellent, excellent season for the Mustangs and, and Coach Snyder. But in the end, I want to agree with you here with, with Coach Graves and, and Rock, Rock Ridge. Fun team to, fun team to watch. Uh, again, we, we saw from week one how good we thought they would be. That came to fruition all the way into the deep playoff run in two ways. So a uh, great job for Coach Graves. And, uh, yep, we're, we're in agreement on this one. All right, so there we go. Our Three Rivers Athletic Conference Coaches of the Year, Ryan Pearson from Princeton and Sam Graves from Rock Ridge. Congrats to both of them. Let's jump into the Lincoln Trail Conference. We have four nominees, Mitch, for Coach of the Year in the Lincoln Trail Conference. And we should have stated at the top of the show that just so viewer or listeners, you know, understand, maybe they've already picked up on it. We don't talk about any of this before we start podcasting. We no. literally type up all the notes and then hit record. And we kind of decide on the fly here who's going to be our, you know, winners. So, it, yeah, it, it, even even from a like during the season from a week to week basis, what we used to do versus what we do now. I, I, I give us credit that we're a lot better at, at just going to fly with this. <laughs> yeah. Instead of writing these paragraphs of game recaps and this and the other thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if the listeners could see that we're just kind of going off an Excel spreadsheet that kudos to you, Greg, you put together. Cause I didn't touch it. Um, <laughs> Actually, and, I almost sent you a text today saying, do you have like the ability to get in and work on that? Or you just, and didn't? I didn't. Okay. And I didn't. I, I was, <laughs> I, I apologize. I, I've been so busy. Uh, so again, a lot of credit goes to you to be able to do this. So I'll, I'll, I'll make it up to you in the season. I'll, I'll, I'll make it up to you. So I appreciate right. your, uh, your on this. There you go. All right. Well, let's get into Lincoln trail conference coach of the year. We'll start with Grant Goldstrand from Rova Williams field. Mitch, this was a coach that I, a program, I should say that I kind of looked at early in the season. I had mm -hmm. talked to some coaches around the area that knew that new coach Goldstrand, 
and said, watch out for that team. He's a great coach, and this is the year that he's got some pieces in place with some experience. He's ready to make a move. Yeah. And as it turns out, the, those, those coaches that I talked to were right. And I had been high on them from the very beginning. Actually, I'm going to take a minute to give Matt Randazzo some crap here because in the preview show on the score, I mentioned Rova Williams Field in, in, our, in our preview on WQAD. And because TV, you know, you want to say everything in a 30-second time frame, things get cut out once in a while. We ran short on time, and that got <laughs> cut out. He cut he yeah. cut out my 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 bragging about that I think Rova Williams Field is going to be good. And now, as it turns out, they're a playoff team. They're on the rise. So, Dazzo, you should have never cut that part out because I, you know, that was my prediction. And I had it. You know, it, it's a smart move by Dazzo because now there's no record of it. Um, <laughs> So I guess we'll have to take you. We'll have to take it your word here, Greg. Yeah, I um, guess. Well, yeah, but it, you know, if you remember too, we got a lot of flack uh, when we did what did we do midseason awards or something like that this year, and we kind of uh, yep. didn't include some Rova players. So we got a lot of flack for that. So um, yeah, it, it it goes back to the overall effort of the whole the whole operation and the whole team there um, coming back from two and seven year last year uh, schedule. You know, closing out the season with with Anaheim Weathersfield in Knoxville, it's tough for anybody. Um, set them back a little bit, but they still get into that one A playoffs. And again, anytime you can go two and seven and then go to the playoffs the next season, that's a great turnaround. This is a great year for for the Cougars. Yep. So it was uh, the first playoff appearance for the Rova Williamsfield Co-op, which is a fairly new formation, and it was also their first playoff win. So they got that first round win over Stark County. So. Credit to Coach Goldstrand and, and for that program for getting there and getting that win. And a young team, a team that yep. I think is going to make some noise uh, next season in with with the expansion, with the Land of Lincoln Conference, if that's if I'm remembering what that's called. The LLC. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think that team's going to make some noise with what they bring back. See, now that, there's some bulletin board material for you. I, I like the and, Cougars. And I won't, even, I won't even cut it out like Dazzo would. Right. Yeah, see <laughs> – well, speaking of turnaround stories, the next coach on our list, Jade Nord from Stark County. The Rebels lost to Rova Williamsfield in the playoffs, like we mentioned, but what a successful turnaround in Stark County. They were 1-8 in 2022. They make it back to the postseason for the first time since 2017. Credit to Coach Nord. I've always been impressed with the way he leads that program, and it had been some tough, it had been a tough couple years in Stark County, but to see them back in the playoffs where they had traditionally been year in and year out, that was great to see. That is certainly deserving of being on this list. So now we continue to move up the LTC standings. Another nominee for coach of the year, Andrew Hofer from Mercer County. Mercer County, year in and year out, near the top of the conference. This year, they fought back. They're right there in a three-way tie for the conference championship. Actually, the, the news we've had in the offseason, Andrew Hofer announced that he has stepped down from his position as head coach and has taken his position with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So we mm -hmm. wish him well and, you know, give him congratulations on a great coaching career at Mercer County. And I believe he was at Polo before he came to Mercer County. So overall, he's had a lot of success. And this year he was right near the top of the three or of the Lincoln Trail. Mitch, the game that stands out to me for them was in week nine. They played Anawan Weathersfield. Yeah. And it was one of those games where it was a battle of two of the top teams in the conference. And as it turns out, Mercer County gets the win 43 to nothing in that game. Really mm -hmm. impressive statement win. That's kind of what puts him on the list for me as a nominee for coach of the year. Well, and you, and you, you look back a couple of weeks too, they had that, that real tough loss to Prairie Central, right? 50, 53 to six. And they yep. followed that up with two back-to-back -back shutout victories. So they ended the season right, get into the playoffs. Um, and, and as you said, it, at the time, certainly probably wasn't aware that this was his last year, but uh, he goes out with a great season, a great team, um, and a great career there as head coach of Mercer County. Yep. So Andrew Hope for a nominee for coach of the year. How about Anawan Weathersfield? We just mentioned them. They fell short in that game against Mercer County, but overall a great season for Tony Grip and the Titans. Tony Grip, another nominee for Lincoln Trail Conference Coach of the Year. Yeah. Um, and this is another one of those 
those situations where the team last year, five and four, get into the playoffs, they lose first round and five and five, and they get those two extra wins. So you see the improvement, right? You, you yep. saw how good this team was. Uh, you, you saw their offense. Uh, maybe not as explosive as we've seen different Titan teams in the past, but they were able to get those wins. Um, you know, they, they battled tough all year. And uh, again, that last uh, week nine loss to, to Mercer County aside, really, really great season for, for the Titans yet again. And uh, finished, uh, they were one of the, the tri champions, right? They were one of the tri champions of the LTC. They were one of the tri champions. Yep. They were along with Mercer County and Knoxville, which leads us into our fourth nominee from the Lincoln Trail Conference, Ryan Hebbard as a potential, uh, you know, coach of the year in the Lincoln Trail. Knoxville, again, just consistently a good football team. Now that they've moved into the Lincoln Trail Conference, it's been no different. They're battling right there at the top of the conference. They took a share of it the year before with A-Town. This year, they have the three-way share with it. But um, another impressive season for Knoxville. They're kind of one of those teams that they do what they do, and you got to try and stop them. And and a lot of times, teams really struggle to stop them. Yeah, uh, a team that I think scored the most points in the LTC and gave up the second least amount uh, and then certainly made it all the way to the quarterfinals. So this was... Yep. Uh, I've been a big fan of Knox for the past two seasons that we've, we've had the pleasure of covering them. Um, another, another great year. They were the ones, Greg, that lost uh, to the eventual uh, uh, the semifinalists in, in, in Tri-Valley. So, okay, okay, there um, you go. Yeah, but, but good wins in, in, the, in the playoffs over uh, Meridian and then over uh, – Bismarck Henning wrote Ross Bill Alvin, right? <laughs> That's a lot of names, but yeah, yep. Doesn't yep. matter, they lost. Um <laughs> yeah, so again, another another great year for Knoxville and uh and for coach there. Um but oh I mean overall again, we're talking about three teams that were that or three coaches I should say that all shared uh a conference championship th- this year. Uh how often does that happen, right? So three really, really uh or sorry, four. I'm sorry, four. Um, coaches here in, in in this conference that all took a step, whether it was record wise, regrouping personnel wise, they all seem to have, have taken a step forward. Yep. So who starts this one? I think I do. Okay. Well, I'm glad you do because I don't know. I don't know where I'd go with this one. Yeah. This, this and, and again, sometimes we're we're uniform in our decisions. Sometimes we're not because we don't talk about this beforehand. This could be one of those times. Um. The suspense gonna, is killing me. I, I know, and I, I'm st- I'm still trying to decide. I'm I'm gonna go uh, again, close. But when you look at what they did in the season and their playoff run, I I'm gonna go Coach Hebert here in Knoxville. Um, I've, I've just been impressed with them again for two seasons in a row now. They've had a share of the conference championship for two seasons in a row now. And to, to make that, I think last year they lost to Bishop McNamara in the first or second round of the playoffs. So they make a, another game or two run in the playoffs before losing to a good Tri-Valley team. Really been impressed again with the Blue Bullets, what they do year in and year out. This year's no different. So my, my selection, it should hear yours, but mine is, uh, is Coach Hybrid there in Knoxville. So I love the turnaround stories in Rova Williams Field and Stark County. I love seeing programs rise up from some down years. Right. But Mitch, I will also agree with you that they, that Knoxville's playoff run this season in a vacuum puts that it pushes them over the edge. They lost a close game to Dupec in the middle of the yep. season and their other loss in the regular season was to Anawan Weathersfield at Anawan at the field in Anawan, which I feel like always means a little more for that Anawan William Anawan Weathersfield program because it's one once a year thing. So I think, you know, that was a unique atmosphere that they had to go play there and they fell short in that one in a close, in a good game, but overall, then they make it back to the quarterfinals. So I'm, I'm going with Hebert as well. Ryan Hebert for our view from the West coach of the year in the Lincoln trail conference. So that brings us to the Northwest upset Illini. Mitch, let's talk about the coaches from the NUIC 
the nominees for Coach of the Year. Mitch, we're going to start with a guy named Rick Arend from Lena Winslow. Never heard I'm, of him. I'm, <laughs> now, don't say that because he's going to get mad. He's going to think that we don't, you know, that we don't talk to him enough. So, no. So, head coach Rick Arend from Lena Winslow. Mitch, again, kind of like Ryan Pearson, we talked earlier. What else do you say? I mean, yeah. his team is ready to execute game in and game out. And this year above years past, I really felt like there was never a letdown with this team. There was never, it just didn't seem like there was ever a moment in question. I mean, it, they just every week showed up and they played, they played their style of football and they challenged people to try and stop them. And man, it's just, it's, you can't do it this year. You couldn't do it. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think it's any surprise that he's a name on this list. Right. You know, you talk about a team, a program who's had the target on their backs the past couple of years. You know what they're going to do offensively and, and no one. Yep. <laughs> uh, aside from, from last year, losing to force in the regular season. But for the most part, no one has, has been close uh, uh, to stopping them. So, um, uh, again, you, you have the most talented team in, in the conference, um, but, but to year in and year out, put together the results that they do, the championships that they now have, um, j- just again, uh, Coach Aaron, an, an incredible season this year, a lot of fun to watch, great team, uh, state championships or state champions, and yeah, it wouldn't feel right if he wasn't included in, in a yearly coach of the year uh, <laughs> list. Uh, coach Hoffman and Dupec would be mad because you only mentioned that Forreston beat him last year. And, and Dupec yes. did it as well. So, <laughs> but retracted. yeah, retracted. Yeah. Yep. So Rick Aaron as a nominee for coach of the year in the NUIC. But there's other ones on this list, Mitch, that yeah, really sure. give a compelling case. The one of them being Dan Sheets from Dakota. Mm-hmm. We had talked about the hire of Dan Sheets, and and this Dakota program was really in need of, you know, a breath of fresh air, a shot in the arm. It, 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 the program had gotten a little stagnant, and it just seemed like there wasn't numbers, there wasn't excitement around the program, which was, it felt weird, right? It just didn't feel right that they weren't in the mix in Dakota right. in in the in the NUIC standings. And this year, we already talked about the game against Forreston. I felt like that was the game where it kind of like opened our eyes. Like, oh, you know, you go through the list and think, okay, they'll win this one, this one, this one. And that maybe wasn't a game that we thought they would win. And that really kind of changed the season for them. I should mention, they fell short against uh, Eastland Pearl City later in the season. That, That was the very next week. Yeah. So, you know, it was up and down, but either way, this Dakota team and and what they were able to do to kind of bounce back from what was two and seven, I believe, the year before, you mm-hmm. got to put Dan Sheets on this list. They got a great win in the playoffs against Marquette. I remember watching the game, so I should know. The comeback win where they just, you know, they controlled the football and completely controlled the game against the Marquette team that was trying to do the exact same thing. So right. that to me is a coaching win in itself for Dan Sheets. So he's certainly worthy of a nomination here. Yeah, and it's funny looking at it now. We're I, we're both in agreement that that Forreston win in week four um, set them up for the the run or at least getting in the playoffs. But they lost their next two games after that. Uh, as you mentioned, they lost EPC and then they lost to Dupac the following week. So they're sitting there after week six at three and three. Yeah, with games with games against Galena. West Carroll and Fulton uh, and knowing you had to win two of those. And, and unfortunately they did against Galena and, and West Carroll before losing to Fulton. So um, yeah, even, even though they lost those two in the middle of the season that forced and win, you know, maybe provided them some confidence. So after those two losses, they could have looked back and said, look, we know we can do this. We know we can get, get these wins. And then again, like you mentioned, make make a little bit of a playoff run for the first time in a while for Dakota. Certainly in, in my years, they were a powerhouse winning a couple of state titles. So good to see this Dakota team back in the fold. Conference is better when Dakota is better. And this is a great season for Coach Sheets. Yeah, quarterfinal playoff run like you just mentioned there. They had a road win in round one, 14, or 16-14 over Iroquois West, 
a team that was seven and two on the year. So yeah. you go on the road in, in week one of the playoffs against a team that's seven and two, and you come away with that close win, the win against Marquette, which we referenced, and then they uh, fall short against Forreston in the quarterfinals. But a great turnaround for the Dakota Indians, which puts Dan Sheets on this list. Another name that makes the list that has a very compelling case for coach of the year. How about Keenan Janicki from Forreston? They're five and four going into the playoffs. Now, this was a team that Kyle Kampmeyer called out from NUICfootball.com saying this is a team to watch in the in the class 1A playoffs at five and mm-hmm. four. And look where they end up in the state semifinals. Yeah, I, I think we all kind of thought that. Um, right? They they were sitting at uh, five and three <clears throat> going into the final week uh, against Lena, which of course is, is never fun. But as we mentioned last year, uh, they proved that they, they could beat Lena fell short in week nine. Um, so uncharted territory for, for Forrest and coming in at five and four, at least for the past couple of years. But we all said at that time, that's a team you do not want to see <laughs> at five and yep. four. And, and they showed why making it all the way to uh, the, the semifinals. So yeah, coach Janicki, this, this was, uh, a, a up and down year in the regular season, right? They, they kind of went win loss, win loss the first couple of weeks. Um, but to, to settle in at the right time and make a playoff run makes uh, their it makes it all the more impressive and, and a great season. Next on our list, how about Patrick Lower from Fulton? Mitch, mm-hmm. it's a quarterfinal appearance for the Steamers. They've jumped into the Northwest Upstate Illini and they and they fit in just fine making playoff appearances, making playoff runs. This year was no different. Yeah, uh, second, second straight year um, that, that, that they made the playoffs. Uh, they could have made, I guess, more than that. But um, back-to-back years, I should say, at least, for, for Fulton and Patrick Lohr. Made a bit of a run, right, as we kind of thought that a lot of all five NUIC teams would, um, a handful of which, you know, four of which being in that 1A bracket. Um, Fulton gets a nice win. Uh, over a, a perennial playoff team in Aurora Christian in round one. And then a game in round two that I think surprised us a little bit because we were really impressed with Rock, uh, Rockford Lutheran. Um, but the weather in that week two, uh, as we talked about in, I think we we're talking about Quincy, um, that played into Fulton's style of play and that they get a huge, huge shutout win. And then before uh, finally falling to Lena Winslow in the quarters, which you, know, you can't say, <laughs> you know, you can't go, real bad about that but it it goes to show the type of season that they had great season for Fulton here now Mitch we have five teams that made the playoffs in the NUIC so it's only Mm -hmm. fitting that we have five nominations as a potential coach of the year that only leaves Tyler Hoffman from Dupec as the uh, remaining nomination Dupec again right in the mix they make another good playoff appearance here another good playoff run into the in the second round they played a tough game against Reed Custer. They do fall short against a really talented Reed Custer team. But again, after losing so much talent the year before, Dupec bounces back. Tyler Hoffman does what he needs to do to get this team in the right position. And, you know, led by A.J. Mulcahy, they did great work here. Yeah, uh, you said that A.J. Mulcahy was a lot of fun to watch. Close, close loss this year in the regular season of Fulton, um, in addition to a loss to Lena. but. Um, uh, again, the, the, the Rivermen have been a lot of fun to watch the past couple of years. Right. And this was a bit of a re a bit of a reload for them, uh, getting a new quarterback this year, um, and still putting up the wins, getting into the playoffs. So this was, uh, as you mentioned, another great season for coach Hoffman. And I, I anticipate them being in the same, you know, same sort of success to continue for them moving forward. Yep. So I think this is my pick, correct? Yeah. Yes. Oh, again, I, I don't want to pick first because I'm not really sure I know where I'm going to go. But when looking through the list, I I think I'm going to go, and I know it's the kind of the lazy pick here, okay. but I'm going Rick Arend and Lena Winslow. I know. Okay. I picked okay. the coach that wins the, the wins the championship. You know, that's easy to pick that one. But yeah. the reason the reason I'm going that way is because I just felt like the way they played this year was an indication of how well coached they were, that they were, they never seemed phased, right? Their players always seemed prepared and ready for what was coming. That's coaching, right? That's, 
that means you've been game, you know, watching game film and you've been scheming and they were ready to go and ready to be put in the right positions. And certainly the athletes are out there and ready to make the plays. I'm, I'm going to go Rick Aaron here, okay. but I, I will be ready for the debate, Mitch, if that's where we want to go. Well, I, I, I don't think when, when you, when you talk about coaches in the NUIC that you debate as much as you agree. Um, Cause I, you, you, I'm certainly not going to debate against what coach Aaron has done. I, I would, I would not do that. But when I look at it, um, I, I'm going to look at a team that had their backs against the wall, regrouped at the right time and made an impressive run in the playoffs and that's going to be Coach Janicki and Forreston. Um, as mentioned, a five and four team. We said that we didn't want, you know, you wouldn't want to be an opposing team in the playoffs against a five and four Forreston team. And this showed why uh, getting a win against a good St. B team in round one. The second round game was, was really where we thought, okay, Forreston might have claim to beating Lena Winslow. A, 44 to 16 win over a previously unbeaten Chicago Pope team in round two. They followed that up with Dakota. Uh, it's certainly a game that they, they were probably thinking about for a handful of weeks, right? A, a revenge yeah. game. But you still have to go out and play against a hot Dakota team at the time. They get that win and then sets up the big clash in the semifinals with Lena Winslow. So I, I think for me, again, with what, where they sat um, at, what were they, th three and three, I, I think, whatever it was, five, five and, I think they were five and three and then lost to Lena in week nine. So where they sat going into the playoffs and where they finished the playoffs is what impresses me the most. Um, and so my vote will, will differ in this one uh, for Coach Janicki at Forreston. No, in, in the interest of having one uniform selection from the view, representing the View from the West podcast, I can I can be talked into this one because I okay. I do agree that for as much as I was impressed with, you know, like I said, the coaching to get Alina Winslow team prepared week in and week out, I am impressed with really coaching up kids over that mental hurdle of being five and four and knowing that, hey, if we do things the right way, if we play, you know, the best we can, we can win these football games. Cause you know what I mean? When you're you know, young 16, 17, 18 year old high school kids, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the emotion, right? If things don't go right and you right. start to doubt. And I, I, so I, I give, I will give coach Janicky credit there and that coaching staff. So I, I can be talked into it. I will agree that we'll give coach Janicky, Kenan Janicky, okay. the Northwest upstate Illini coach of the year, according to view from the West podcast. Coach Aaron is never going to talk to us again. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, that's that may be true. That may be true. Yeah, and actually, I feel bad because he'll, I he'll copyright to, he'll copyright his, his sound bites, and we'll never. You no, know, what he'll do <laughs> is he'll let us interview him, but he'll copyright his sound bites, so we can never use the audio. <laughs> what would be really sneaky is he, he would allow me to do an interview with him, but then play the you know it's the most wonderful time of the year in the background so that it's all copyrighted so i can't use any of it anyway so no of all of all this i reached out to him this week looking for some stats and some numbers and he he apologized but he couldn't get me anything because he had no power well, there, yeah there's your well there's the tiebreaker then he couldn't get a stats so well, no mitch he doesn't he didn't have any power and he apologized for that and he said but let me let me know when the episode's up and i'll give it a listen so now he's going to listen and we didn't even give him the award. So yeah, well, we're, we're backing ourselves into a corner here. Aren't we? <laughs> All right. Well, before we back into the corner, even farther, let's yeah. move into the defense of the year and then we'll move into our team of the year. So let's move right along here. Mitch, we did not do a defense of the year in the last couple uh, awards episodes in the previous years. This is a new award for us, but I really yeah. want to give some shout out to the defenses that played, played really well. We'll give one overall award here. So let's go through some nominees real quick. Stop me along the way if you got, you know, some talking points. But <laughs> Sterling is certainly a team that'll make that list. You know, Kendrick Muhammad, J.P. Schilling, Kale Ryan, A.J. Kested, names that came up for them a lot. Also in the Western Big Six, Moline, Heisen Beibui, honorable, 
mention All-Stater. I should mention Kale Ryan was an All-Stater for Sterling. You had uh, Jasper Ogburn, 103 tackles, six tackles for loss. Grant Sibley, great on offense, also great on defense. He had five interceptions and broke up 11 passes. Also, Christian Rea was a name we heard a lot. We moved down the way. Princeton held opponents to 97 points this season. Mm -hmm. That's the lowest of any team in our area. That was in the regular season, I should say. Held the lowest of any team in our area. You had Payne Miller, Bennett Williams with 82 tackles. Both of them are juniors coming back. Augie Christensen, Danny Shahaki at linebacker. You had Tegan Davis playing defense as well, played a great defense. And also Noah Laporte, Mitch, only a sophomore, but that kid could be somebody to watch. Yeah, um, I'll cut right to the chase on that while we're on the topic. My, my pick's going to be Princeton in this. Um, you, look at, you look at what they did all year, and certainly some of this was set up by their offense, right? Um, they, they started off the season allowing four straight games of 20 points, 22, 20, 20, and 21. Um, now, some of those, they, they were all blowout victories, so you saw a lot of uh, uh, either backups or, or newbies playing in, in the majority of the second half of those games. But the final five games of the regular season, they allowed 14 points with three shutouts, seven points against Kiwani and seven points against St. Bede, and shutouts against Newman, Bureau Valley, and Monmouth Roseville. So – this was and when you get into the playoffs too. Certainly, we talked about it earlier with with how good that three A playoff bracket was. Defense is going to win you those games, and they certainly did. And I'm I'm specifically thinking of the Genoa King, Kingston game. Um, they came in with a really good offense, similar style to them, and they did nothing against that Princeton defense. And even as talented as ICCP is and was last season, they weren't doing what they did most of the season against Princeton, not even close. So yeah, to me, as you mentioned, only allowing uh, in the regular season uh, 97 points against them. This is a clear cut. Again, all, all great defenses this year, we, as you mentioned with the Sterling Moline, other teams we saw, but, but for me, far and away, the, the winner for best defense of the year is Princeton. A few other names to bring up. Um, obviously the three-way tie in the Lincoln Trail, Mercer County, Knoxville, and Anawan Weathersfield, all pretty close defensively if you're going to look for a team in that conference. But what I would give a shout out to Matthew Sentney, the Lincoln Trail Conference Defensive Player of the Year. He had 124 tackles, 76 solo tackles, 11 tackles for loss. He was a first-team All-State selection Mitch, he was all over the field on defense. Yeah. Really, really fun player to watch defensively. So I wanted to give a shout out to him on the defensive side of the ball. Obviously, Lena Winslow, great defensively, led them to a state championship with Gage Dunker, Gunnar Lobdell, Jace Flynn. How about Fulton? They had Zane Parnell, Connor Sheridan, Joel Ford, all with 100 plus tackles mm -hmm. you know, on, on the field. So that's a lot of production defensively for Fulton. Um, but Yep, I think I would agree that um, that Princeton team really impressed me on both sides of the ball. But, you know, defensively, I'm, I'm right with you. Let's give it to them. The defensive team of the year, the Princeton yep. Tigers, according to view from the West. So, Mitch, now we're just talking team of the year. Overall, best team of the year. Obviously, we've talked about a lot of these teams already, but we'll, we'll get into it. Our nominees... Moline, Princeton, Lena Winslow, and West Central. So you got a pair of state champions in there in West Central in eight man, Lena Winslow in 11 man, Princeton and Moline playing very well, playing great football, like we talked about. Yeah. What do you think? Well, uh, and again, you, you have, you have, teams here who had phenomenal seasons as you mentioned you you have lena winslow in west central as state champions princeton and moline making playoff runs um for, for me and again this goes back to what you were mentioning with coach aaron in how well the team prepares week in and week out year after year 
um, and, and to close out with, with yet another state championship, um, my choice here for team of the year is Lena Winslow. So fun to watch. You know, they could have had any number of of three running backs each week that could have had a hundred yards. And then that, that defense that just was devastating all year, a playoff run through a gauntlet of one, a teams, mostly, (laughs) mostly conference members there when they had all, all final four in the North bracket were from the NUIC. So with, with who they played, how they played and games that they won state champions, Lena Winslow, they're going to be my team of the year. I agree with you. I think team of the year, just the way they executed all year long, you said it right there. I, I've been impressed with them. They ran the table, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the best compliment you can give them. They never, they never lost. They never faltered. I'm going with our 11 man team of the year, Lena Winslow, but let's give the eight man team of the year award. We mentioned West central. I think you'd also have to throw Amboy in the mix. Yeah. But I'm going to say because they won the state championship and, you know, running the table as well, I'm going West Central as our team of the year in the eight-man division. Yeah, they're just so exciting to watch. Um, you know, that state championship was a lot of fun. Obviously, we talked about the semifinal game. Uh, we'll, we'll get into Drossi's stats in a minute, but off the top of my head, it was like over 3,000 yards and 58 touchdowns. So this, this was just a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, a fun team to watch week in and week out, uh, you know, cultivating in a state championship at the end of the year. So yeah, this is, this is a great team worthy of the pick for team of the year and eight man. But I will say the way Amboy played the way that they, what they went through this year, injuries kind of came back, made their long playoff run. I think they don't have very many, they didn't have very many seniors. I think they bring back a lot next year. I think that's a team to watch as a potential team of the year for next year. Yep. Well, Mitch, before we move into our players of the year, we should also name our coach of the year in the eight-man ranks. You mentioned Amboy there with Scott Payne. But again, Jason Kirby from West Central, he gets a state championship. Jason Kirby's been a coach for a long time in in Illinois high school football. He gets that state title in the eight-man ranks. I think I would go Jason Kirby there from West Central. Do you have any, any debate on that? No, I don't think so. Uh, Jason Kirby, a coach, uh, back when I was around at Bureau Valley. So um, good, good to see him finally get a championship there. And and again, what what we just said about the team of the year, exciting team. They were dominant. Jossie was dominant. Uh, Yeah. Jason Kirby coach of the year in the eight man ranks. All right. So there we go. It's now time for the, you know, the big awards here, the players of the year from each conference. We start in the Western Big Six. Mitch, we got a lot of names here. We'll go through the list a little bit. But I think we start with Riley Fuller in Moline. 1,719 yards, 25 total touchdowns in 10 games because they had a forfeit win over Alleman. That's an average of 171 yards per game. In two games, he was over 250 rushing yards. So mm-hmm. his his stats were very impressive all year long. He led this Maroons team. But right next to him, I think 1A, 1B, he was an all-stater on the defensive side of the ball. But how about Kale Ryan for Sterling? Mm-hmm. Over 1,100 yards, 1,185, 26 total touchdowns. He was just an impact player. You know, there's no way around it, right? I mean, there's no other way to say it. He was on the field making a difference. I think you also, though, for Sterling, you kind of look at the quarterback position with J.P. Schilling. They Mm kind of split time there, kind of a 1A, 1B. J.P. Schilling also played really well at the quarterback position. But when you're speaking about quarterbacks, I think you have to bring up Braden Little. Mitch, Mm -hmm. go through through some of his numbers for us because they were eye-popping, and he's only a sophomore. Yeah, so he, he looks like he was just under 3,000 yards on the year, 24 total touchdowns. Uh, his big one was in the, in the week one of the playoffs. This was kind of a, a quarterback shootout, but he finished with 432 yards passing uh, in, in that win in round one. And uh, our, our guy, Chris Dewar, uh, let us know he was the KHQA Offensive Player of the Year. And as you mentioned, just a sophomore, 
I expect Brain Little to uh, be the, the top of the class in this conference for the next two years and really excited to see what uh, what that Blue Devil team with it does with him. Uh, I would say under center, but I think they go shotgun. So we'll just say behind center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple other names here. Connor DeUlio, quarterback from Rock Island. You also had Grant Sibley, the quarterback from Moline, threw for 910 yards, had a hand in 13 total touchdowns. A few wide receivers, Gregory Quince from Quincy, Joe Allen, Tykel Hammers from Quincy. Go figure that some of the Quincy wide receivers had big numbers because they were right. they were getting fed the ball a lot. So right. Antonio Tablante, also running back uh, from Sterling, who's a nominee here. You had Quantarian Brooks, first team, all big, t- big 10, all big six selection, <laughs> had a team high. 1,395 yards, 15 touchdowns in conference play. And then Jarius Rice, the, you know, the kind of the yin to the yang of uh, Braden Little, put up a lot of yards on the ground for this Quincy offense. Yeah, um, a lot of fun. Uh, again, a, a great compliment to what Little did in the passing game. Um, there, there was games that Rice was the option, right? Passing game might not have worked. Uh, and Rice really stepped up to the plate. So yeah, all all the the names that you mentioned here, all uh, we got twelve, thirteen here. It, it goes to show the depth of the Western Big Six, right? Um, yep. It, it, certainly, when you talk about Sterling, you talk about Kale Ryan and Schilling and DeBlante. All three of those guys, you you would see weeks where they would all do really well. You might see weeks where one does one does the majority of the workload. So all three of them working together, you can see the results for Sterling. Um, with with Grant Sibley, you, you see a guy who Coach Morrissey could not be more complimentary of, the type of player he is, the type of person he is, who I think just committed to, to Pittsburgh State, um, I believe today. His right, you know, his, his backhand, Riley Fuller, we've talked about him all, all season, just – their go-to running back. If 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 you're making me choose, I don't remember whose pick it is, but I, I suppose I'll I think start. I think you can start. Okay. And this is this is this is tough. Um, but for, for me, as much as a fan of as I am of, of Braden Little, I think his time is going to come. Okay. I think what Riley Fuller did this year for that Moline team sets him apart not not too far apart from some of these other great players but again 171 yards per game two games over 250 uh 25 total touchdowns in, in 10 games when they, they missed the that one week so for me i'm going maroons here i'm going riley fuller as my western big six player of the year yeah this was really tough for me as well because i've debated for a long time. I think the the actual Western Big Six MVP was Kale Ryan. And that mm-hmm. led to a little Twitter debate, little discussion about, you know, was that the right pick? And I at the time I, I immediately thought, yeah, I agree. I think it's Kale Ryan. And then the more I thought about it, I man, it's really hard. Yeah, I just started debating more and more. I, you know, who was who was the most dynamic weapon? who was the biggest impact player, the most valuable to their team. Kale Ryan was an all-state, or all-state linebacker, right? So, you know, even forget the offensive contributions. Look what he did on defense. But I think you look at Riley Fuller's numbers. Yeah, I agree. I'm going Riley Fuller as the uh, Western Big Six player of the year. Let's jump into the Three Rivers Athletic Conference. Again, we'll break this up into two. So we'll start with the Western side of the division. And, uh, you know, as we start going through it, it's a little, it's a little Rockridge heavy. If I'm being honest, they had a yeah. lot of impact players here. So we'll go through some of the list here. Uh, Jacob Bain at quarterback threw for over a thousand yards, 14 touchdowns. He was injured for, a, a, you know, a, a good portion of the season near the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so that certainly impacted his numbers. You had Peyton Locke, an impact player we've been following for the past couple of years. He had over 1,000 yards rushing, 13 touchdowns, caught 27 passes, 
for almost 500 yards and another seven touchdowns. So 20 total for him, an impressive stat line. But you also have Cam Bonzak from Rock Ridge, over 600 yards, nine touchdowns. But the name that stands out to me on the Rock Ridge team, how about Connor Dean, Mitch? He pulled off what I'll call the trifecta. He had a passing, he had passing touchdowns. He had a couple of rushing touchdowns and he had a receiving touchdown. Mm-hmm. So he was doing all three phases of the offense there. I'm really impressed with what he did to step in at quarterback when he had never played quarterback before. And it was kind of out of necessity. He really impressed me there, put up 604 yards, passing eight touchdowns only through one interception. So passing the ball around and wasn't prone to turnovers, which is a huge key, right? Getting late in the season and you've never played quarterback. You're not turning the ball over. Um, I just thought as far as valuable players go, I think he was very valuable for that Rockridge offense being so versatile. Yeah. What other names? What's that? Yeah. You, you mentioned that the Jacob Bain going down. So yeah, for for Connor Dean to step in and lead that team uh, again to eight and one um, there in, in the regular season. Can't be understated. No question. Yep. A couple other names here. You have Jace Grunder, Erie Prophetstown, team that finished four and five, didn't make the playoffs, but the numbers he put up, Mitch, he's in this conversation, no doubt about it. 1,600 yards rushing, 21 touchdowns, average 9.1 yards per carry, and on the defensive side of the ball, 121 total tackles. That's a name you cannot deny in this conversation. One more name to bring up. You had Carter Brown from Sherrard really burst onto the scene for the Tigers, 48 receptions, 700 yards, eight touchdowns. So I'm going to, I'm going to start on this one. Okay. And I, I, like I said, when it comes to terms of most valuable player, I think Connor Deem was a very valuable piece for this Rockridge offense but I'm going to go with Jace Grunder mm-hmm. because this offense for Beard Prophetstown really ran through him and they needed him to make the plays and he made a lot of them. And I was, I was really impressed with his efforts this season. I'm going to go Jace Grunder on this side of the conference. Yeah. And you know, I, I am in agreement with you here. Um, you, you talk about two way players, what they mean to that team, obviously, the Panthers playoff hopes came down to the final, the final game of the year when they lost to Morrison. Um, but, but Grunner was electric in that game. He was electric all season. You know, it seemed like every week we would say, or we would see results that Grunder had three touchdowns, four touchdowns, five touchdowns, right. Um, all while also being the lead tackler for this division um, in, in the conference full of talent, right. Um, Jace Grunder was right up there with, with names that we'll talk about here in a minute as maybe the most dynamic, maybe the most exciting, versatile players. So yeah, with, with what Grunder did on offense, what he meant to that team on both sides of the ball, this is a good pick and my pick as well for uh, for player of the year in the West slash rock division <laughs> of the, of the track. Absolutely. There you go. All right. Well, I will tell you, it only gets harder from here on out. This, Yeah, this is not easy here next. So now we hop into the Eastern side And I think we have to start with two names, Mitch, Tegan Davis and Mac Resetich. There's more names on the list, but let's go through their numbers first. Yeah. Tegan Davis from Princeton quarterback over 2,400 total yards. He had 20 touchdowns through the air. He had another 17 on the ground. He (laughs) intercepted, he intercepted eight passes and two more touchdowns on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. Just overall, I mean, what else can you say about him? He was a player we almost put in as a player of the year a year ago, you know, as our overall player of the year, not just yeah. for the conference. He almost made our overall player of the year and he was back again this year and he put up even bigger numbers. Yeah. He was my, my top fantasy selection last season. That's um, right. Yeah. Remember that. And I think he would be right up there again. Um, a sh- shout out to, Tiger Central Live because I watched a majority of Princeton games this season, yep. and it, it was it was just so much fun, so impressive to see a talent like that uh, play the way that he did, um, and certainly in the end, in, in his, his recruitment initially uh, committed to Eastern Illinois, now going to Iowa. That's well deserved. Playing on defense, um, 
with how athletic he is. You can see it now in the basketball court too, right? Um, it, it was it was such a fun career to follow for Tegan Davis. Yeah. So Tegan Davis was, you know, obviously putting up eye popping numbers, but he was not alone. No. He was not alone. Like we mentioned, Mac Resetich, Spring Valley Hall, single season rushing records for both yards, which was 2,227, and touchdowns, 30 for Spring mm-hmm. Valley Hall, both school records. He passed for 378 yards and four touchdowns, but he was a kick return specialist and punt returner as well. That's what ended up, I think, leading him to getting the offer from Illinois. He's now mm-hmm. committed to University of Illinois, and I think they're going to use him in a special teams type of role, maybe on some defensive side of the ball to utilize his speed. But three kick returns and also one punt return for touchdowns. Mitch, I, I just, for as impressive as Tegan Davis was, I really can't remember a name bursting onto the scene like Mac Resetich did this year for the Spring Valley Hall team. He had been there. He had been producing. We had called his name before, but this year it was different. It was every game. It was five more touchdowns, four right. more touchdowns. Yeah, the, the only and it's funny because I just that very second, the only the only other player that came to mind that kind of in the style that he played uh, was Garrett Barnes. Yeah, um, absolutely. With with how dynamic he was and the yards that he put up uh, way back when, but. Yeah, like like you said, every single game that we talked about, or any sort of uh, video that we had, or the, if the score was there, right? The, yep. the highlights were Macrosedge, Macrosedge, Macrosedge. So, um, seeing the numbers here at the end of, of what he ended up with, and this is regular season, I, you know, um, certainly had that playoff game, tough draw there in the playoff game <laughs> against yeah. Saber well, yeah. Um But it, even then, the, you saw before that game. Uh, Remind me of the coach's name there, Sager Hart Griffin. Oh, uh, Ken Leonard. Leonard, yeah. Um, that they put out a, a pregame video type of thing, and he was given Resetich credit. And to, to, to see, you know, to get the attention of a coach Leonard, that's high praise. And certainly Illinois caught on to that as well. So, yeah, um, a, a great year, certainly. Uh, certainly, you, you never do anything single handedly, but without him, I, I don't think Hall makes the playoffs. Certainly not. So, this was an incredible, incredible year. Happy for Mac Resetich that he, he got the uh, recognition he deserved by Illinois. Excited to see what's next for him, too. Yep. Okay, so a few more names on the list from this eastern side of the division in the Three Rivers. John Brady, St. Beat Academy, almost 1,500 yards, 12 touchdowns. He, almost, he also rushed for 1,000 yards and 17 touchdowns. So he put up a ton as well. Very impressive numbers from him. You also have from Princeton, Augie Christensen, over 1,000 yards rushing with 18 touchdowns. Noah Laporte had 884 yards receiving and 12 touchdowns. Mitch, it's no wonder that Princeton was good because we just called out three players from them with huge numbers. But right. um, I think it's uh, – is it your turn here? I think, I think so. I think it is. Um... No, it's not. Cause I, I, picked, <laughs> uh, I, did, I did Riley Fuller in Western Week 6. No, but I did Jace Grunder in the Three Rivers. Oh, oh right. Okay, yes. Okay, so we're back. <laughs> All right. Well, this will be this will be a first um, on this show because I, I don't think picking one over the other is fair. It's just not. It, it'll, yeah. be, it'll be a while, I think, before we see two – talents like Mac Resetich and Tegan Davis playing, you know, in, in the same season, same seasons, whatever it might be. But what both of those guys did this year, the numbers that they put up, putting their teams in position to win is, is beyond impressive. So I, I, I'm picking both guys here as, as co-players of the year, Tegan Davis at Princeton, Mac Resetich at Hall. Yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I've looked through the numbers and tried to find any way to like give one or the other the edge. And yeah. I just, I don't know where to look. I mean, Tegan Davis is so impressive because of all he did to lead this high powered Princeton team and to kind of be the, you know, the field general on both sides of the ball. That was very impressive. But when you look at Mac Resetich, 
when you talk about a true most valuable player, Spring Valley right. Hall absolutely needed him, and he delivered week in and week out. He was their driving force. They needed him to produce, and he answered the call every time. Yeah. So you're right. That's where like both of them have such an impressive resume, and just for the reasons I described, I don't know how to separate them. You know, it's funny. Again, another Matt Randazzo reference here on the podcast. He texted me a few hours ago before we started recording. He just went to the basketball game mm -hmm. between Spring Valley Hall and Princeton. Princeton came out on, on the upper end, but um, either way, he, he asked if I was jealous because I, you know, he got to see Mac Rosetich and Tegan Davis compete yeah. against each other in another sport. Right. So, um, yeah, and they probably will in baseball too. I, I, I know Rosetich plays, I imagine Tegan Davis plays. He might run track, I'm not sure, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, jealous of Dazzo to just see that matchup one final time on, on in, in any any sort of competition, right? Yeah. So, yep. but um, yeah, if we're in agreement here, I, I think that's the right call um, to give both of these guys the, the recognition that they have so richly deserved and co-players yep. from this podcast. All right, so there's a first in the three years of awards. We have the co-players of the year from the Three Rivers Athletic Conference Eastern side, Tegan Davis, Mac Rosetich, now time for the Lincoln Trail Conference. Mitch, the last time we'll give out the player of the year for the Lincoln Trail Conference. Next year, they're moving into the, the Lincoln land. So, Well, and we'll, we'll have two awards, right? Because we'll have two different divisions to, that's to true. give out next year. So, yeah. That's correct. All right. That means more teams. We haven't really thought about that yet. It's, we're adding a lot of workload. Job security. <laughs> that's Job There you security. go. There you go. All right. Well, let's get into it here. Let's look at the quarterbacks. Riley Danner from Rova Williams Field, over 1,600 yards passing, 14 touchdowns. You had Colby Cox, 1,100 yards passing, 16 touchdowns, 64% completions, and 540 yards rushing and seven touchdowns. That's for Colby Cox. And Dylan Ori from Anawan Weathersfield, 787 yards passing, eight touchdowns, also at over 500 yards rushing and seven touchdowns. So Good group of quarterbacks there. Looking at the running backs in the Lincoln Trail, Zeb Rashid, who we called out a lot for Anawan Weathersfield, over 1,100 yards, 16 touchdowns, also had a couple receiving touchdowns. Justin Johnson from Knoxville. Mitch, he also pulled off the trifecta this year. He ran the ball for 26 touchdowns. He caught two receiving touchdowns. And he passed for one touchdown. I think he only threw the ball one time this year, and it was a touchdown. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. absolutely. And I apologize if there's other players that pulled off the trifecta and I didn't see it. I, I apologize. But those were a couple names that came to mind that I saw in the stats. Uh, Brian Bertelschofer, a name we called out a lot for Rova Williams Field, almost 1,000 yards on the ground and nine touchdowns. Matthew Lucas from Mercer County, 612 rushing yards and seven touchdowns. That was in the regular season. A name we have to mention here, Owen Relander. He was the Lincoln Trail Conference Offensive Player of the Year. He rushed for 600 yards, also had 512 yards receiving, 16 touchdowns. So great effort from him. And then also Daniel Kieser from Stark County. Mitch, he had eight interceptions this year three were returned for touchdowns and that's not to mention what he did as a wide receiver for the rebels so yeah. very impressive season for daniel keezer i believe uh i start you do and I'm, and I'm happy about that because this is this is this is one that there's not i don't i don't see a very clear cut winner in my mind um i, I have one in mind that I'll pick, but again, not clear cut. So I'm interested to see where you go with this. Yeah, this one is, uh, this one is tricky. Um, I think what sticks out to me was um, the quarterback play from Riley Danner and Colby Cox, mm -hmm. um, both over a thousand yards and uh, Riley Danner over 1600 yards. Very impressive with 14 touchdowns, but Owen Relander from Mercer County really was versatile and rushed the ball and was catching the ball. It seemed like he was the weapon for Mercer County. I, 
man, and Zeb Rashid was also really good. And, <laughs> um, I think I think I'm gonna go with Owen Relander just based on okay. being the you know valuable asset in the rushing game and in the in the receiving game. Okay. Yeah, that that's a great pick. And as, as you mentioned earlier, he was the the player of the year, offensive player of the year from the conference. Um, and I imagine that was a pretty close close vote as there was a lot of, of good performances here. Uh, for, for me, I, I think what I was always impressed with week in and week out was the play of Mercer County um, yep. and, and the way that, that Colby Cox navigated that offense to a lot of victories this year. Uh, dual threat guy, just under 2,000 all-purpose yards, over 20, looks like right at 23 touchdowns. So you can go a lot of different ways here, I think. But for me, I'm going to go Colby Cox with Mercer County as my player of the year in the LTC. All right. Do I have to do? Do I have to give in again and 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 give in to to Colby Cox here? Well, let's. I, I think. I mean, what impressed me was you know the rushing yards and seven touchdowns on top of the sixteen touchdowns passing, right? Mm-hmm. So. And it look, and you know, even looking at it, Jackson Johnson had 26 touchdowns. Like it's just, you know, this this was a, a conference that you you just saw a lot of good talent spread across within each team, across multiple teams. Um, Zeb Ration had a good year. This is a really really tough tough conference to pick. Um, so I I don't know where we we end up. All right, I. I could go against the Lincoln Trail Conference uh, selection of uh, Player of the Year and go with Colby Cox at quarterback. There, there are we named ten kids, all really good, all deserving. Yep. No, no standout above the other, at least in in our core eyes. Um, but if we're going Colby Cox, I, I don't think that's the wrong pick by any means. It meant so much to that Mercer County team. They they played really well, had a good season. Um, and yeah, he's the last man standing, I guess, for, for this podcast and the, the award show. All right, we're moving into the Northwest Upstate Illini. Let's start with the quarterbacks. Braden Dykstra had over 1,500 yards passing and 16 touchdowns. You had Cooper Hoffman, who all had almost 1,000 yards. I believe he was injured for a little while this season. He had 14 touchdowns. He had a 69% completion percentage, so very impressive. Uh, 365 yards rushing and four touchdowns. How about Caden Niedermeyer from Dakota? Over 1,000 yards passing, 13 touchdowns, five touchdowns on the ground. But then you get into the ground game. You look at Lena Winslow, Gunnar mm-hmm. Lobdell, Gage Dunker, Jake Zeal, all over 1,000 yards. Leading the way was Gunnar Lobdell at 1,500, 24 touchdowns. But leading the way in touchdowns was Gage Dunker with 28. You also had Adrian Arellano. From Dakota, 946 rushing yards, 595 receiving yards, 19 total touchdowns. Johnny Kobler, your boy, Mitch, from Forreston, over 1,400 yards rushing and 24 touchdowns. A.J. Mulcahy from Dupec, over 1,300 yards, 23 touchdowns. A couple wide receivers to mention, Balen Damehoff. Had nine touchdowns receiving. Will Howard for Dupec also makes our nominations. So, Mitch, what are your thoughts here? Ugh, don't make me do this. <laughs> um, and, and again, as we've mentioned before, we're, we're just so lucky uh, to, to be able to cover a conference like the NUIC and, and not only what their postseason successes have, have been, but these individual seasons for, for these great teams, it makes it so hard to pick one as a, a player of the year. I, I would, you know, I would have been interested to see, we, we should have asked Kyle where he would have went with this. I've been to know uh, as the man who, who sees everything in that conference, where he would go with this for me, I think I'm, I'm going to stick to tried and true um, <laughs> with, with a Lena Winslow team. And even then you're narrowing it down to like three players. And it still gets hard. <laughs> yeah. I think I think what he did all year and what he did in the state championship game, I think my player of the year is going to go to Gage Dunker. Um, as you mentioned, 
just under 1,500 yards, 28 touchdowns, was, was a key player on their defense. Um, and again, was, was, it was such a crucial piece to them winning that state championship this year. Kind of came on the scene late last year in the postseason and really made his mark this year. So for me, this like, it's like 1A, B, C, D, E, F, G type of thing. But I'm going to gauge Dunker here as my player of the year. Yeah, it's like you said, it's it's a tough pick. There's a lot of names that stand out. Um, what Caden Niedermeyer and uh, Arilano from Dakota did mm-hmm. to kind of lead them, I thought their numbers were impressive. Johnny Kobler was a name we called out a lot. And as Forreston went, he kind of went. Um, but the same thing with Mulcahy and Braden Dykstra. You know, there's so many names on this list. And what I what I think is so hard to pick when I get down to Lena Winslow is – like Coach Aaron kind of said it best when we interviewed him before the state championship game. And it was Jake Zeal was the burning speed. And you mm-hmm. had Gunnar Lobdell was kind of the power back. Or you had Gage Dunker was kind of the power back. And Gunnar Lobdell kind of did a little bit of both, right? Mm-hmm. He, he kind of split the middle. So you had all three phases of running kind of all in their backfield. So it makes it hard to split them up and pick just one. Right. But I'll give it, I'll give it to Gage Dunker with the 28 total touchdowns. Yeah. I think that when, you know, when they needed to make a play, he was making those plays. And, um, you know, obviously that's no offense. They, they had playmakers all over the field, but 28 times he was getting in the end zone. He was making an impact on defense as well. Yeah. And I think when we do talk like one, a one B, I think even Lobdell is my B, my B selection because, you know, he, it's a, it was his first season coming into Lena Winslow transferring from, from Orangeville. Maybe took him a few weeks, right. To get, yep. Uh, fit into not only Lena Winslow's system, but also into 11-man football. And so maybe after week four or so, it's like, I haven't seen Lobdell's name called too much or see him in the stats. And then, bam, it was, you know, he was their guy uh, the rest of the way through. So an impressive season for him. But just from an overall standpoint, again, I I think we're we're right on track with Gage Dunker and a well-deserving selection as player of the year here in, in, in the NUIC. So there you go. Gage Dunker, our NUIC Player of the Year from the View from the West podcast. Mitch, we got to talk about the eight-man ranks here. Let's go through some names. Tucker Lindemeyer from Amboy, almost 1,000 yards, 13 touchdowns. He was one of the the leaders of that team for Amboy. I believe he was their only senior uh, on the roster. So And hurt. And hurt yeah, for, uh, and he was hurt late in the year. So um, just a very impressive season for him to come as a uh, runner-up for the Amboy Clippers. You also have at quarterback Connor Nye for Milledgeville, over 1,300 yards, 24 touchdowns. How about the season from Carson Reef of AFC, yeah. Ashton Franklin Center? 2,228 yards, 33 touchdowns. Very yeah. impressive numbers there. But when you look at eight-man, the running backs really stand out here. Right. We got Gavin McDonough from Ridgewood, over 1,500 yards and 24 touchdowns. Brock Soltow, 2,407 yards, 35 touchdowns. He also passed for over 200 yards, stepped in there at quarterback, and had one receiving touchdown. So he also hit the trifecta, Mitch. Yep. But Yeah. That, yeah. Go ahead. But I was going to say, that was impressive. But the numbers we got to read here, Mitch, give us the rundown on Caden Drosty. Yeah, so as we've talked about him multiple times throughout this episode, um, you you really, it, it's almost every week you couldn't believe what numbers he put up, and you certainly couldn't believe that it just kept happening every every season or every game of the season. Uh, all told, three thousand two hundred and seventy four yards, fifty eight touchdowns on the year. Wow, just. It, it's it's incredible. It, it was it was it was such a, an impressive impressive year. Uh, you're talking about a player again, like we talked about in the game of the year, where you can trust to just call a halfback toss and trust that he's going to get you in a position to win, let alone score. Um, just just goes to show the type of player that he had and the type of or he what he is and season that he had. Um, and the numbers again speak for themselves in a state championship to boot. Yeah, one more name to bring up from Amboy, Brennan Blaine, wide receiver, 
over a thousand yards receiving 21 touchdowns impressive very you know impact player for amboy but i think mitch there's no way around it you have to go drosty at west central as our eight-man player of the year yeah um you, you know in in any other season uh, carson reef you know throwing for over 2,000 yards and eight man you don't see that a lot right um we, we always see a lot bigger eye-popping numbers in the running game but yeah I, I don't know that we'll ever see a performance you know like this again um so drosty again over 3,000 yards 58 touchdowns clear pick here for player of the year in yeah that's just incredible numbers so our eight man player of the year for the view from the west podcast congratulations Caden drosty from west central what a season he had so mitch that's our eight man player of the year let's give an 11 man player of the year our overall our our View okay. from the West player of the year in 11 man football out of all the names we've mentioned. Okay. So we go through, we have Riley Fuller, Jace Grunder, Mac Rosetich, and Tegan Davis. Mm -hmm. You have um, Colby Cox and, and, Gage. and Gage Dunker. Yep. Well, um, again, going back to the track. And going back to what what Tegan Davis and, and Mac Rosetich did this year, um, I I still again I'm going to call for a co player of the <laughs> year award here. Um, I just it was just so much fun to watch both of those players, um, to watch what they meant to their teams. Um, you know, would, would Princeton be about the same without Tegan Davis, maybe, maybe not, but we know for sure that Hall wouldn't be the same without Mac Rosetich. So um, for, for me, loved what Riley Fuller did all year. Love what Jace Grunder did with, with Erie Prophetstown. Colby Cox, as mentioned, big fan of, of, of Gage Dunker and everything he did. But for, for me, was just so impressed week in and week out, season long. My pick, picks, plural, for co-player of the year is Tegan Davis at Princeton and Mac Rosetich at Hall. Mitch, you said it. I don't know how to split them up. So I think when we start looking down this list, those were the players that stood out to me all year. And I think they'll kind of always be linked for us, right? Just because they were in the same conference in the same division, the same season. So I think right. they're just linked together and they're both going big 10, one to Iowa, one to Illinois. Yep. I, I, yep. I don't know any way how to separate them. And as hard as I can try, I think this is a first in the view from the West podcast, our player of the year for 11 man football from the view from the West podcast. It's co-champions. It's, it's co-winners, Mac Rosetich and Tegan Davis. Congratulations yep. to Princeton and to Spring Valley Hall for their accomplishments and for, uh, you know, for the athletes that they had on the field there. Yep. So Mitch, this wraps it up. This is the finale for the 2022 football season. We're done. I think we had about 33, 30, 32 episodes. So <laughs> yeah. So here we are. We're, we're wrapping it up. And I, I think we said last week, uh, August 28th or whatever that date is, August 25th, I don't know, is 185 days away. So yeah. Uh, you know, we'll have a bit of an off season, I think. And then we'll be, you know, before we know it, we'll be getting ready for season previews and, and summer camp and uh, and eventually leading right up into, into fall practice in week one. So, you know, um, talking about this tonight and, and looking back at the season that we had, it just, it fires me up even more uh, to see what, what comes next and to look forward to next season. Yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm ready to, you know, maybe we'll try to plan some things in the off season and keep the conversation going. But thank you so much to everyone all year long who listened, who downloaded, who followed along on Twitter and, you know, who just kind of interacted with us. It's been a ton of fun. We love doing it. We're not going anywhere. We'll, we'll be back like Mitch referenced. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to get back at it. We'll start. It seems like, you know, we're going to be doing previews and jumping back in before I think before you know it, which is exciting, which is yeah. going to be great.
Yep. So, uh, I can't wait. Can't wait to see what uh, what teams look like because we're talking about a lot of seniors here tonight, Greg. So yep, um, a lot of teams are going to look different. Some returning. Um, so yeah, just again looking looking forward to it, and you know with with how things are, are shaping up with with conference realignments and teams, uh, which we should mention too, Greg. By the way, that when we uh, recorded last week, we were talking about the merger between. Aquin and Orangeville, yeah, as a possibility. And then the very next morning, uh, Kyle broke that they were going to do that. So, um, I don't anticipate maybe that happening much more, but we never know anymore, right? Yeah, so, um, we, we've got we've got open weeks to schedule for, for some teams that have open open games. Um, we're always open to seeing new uniforms, so you know, we, we can we can fill this off season the best that we can. Um, but it'll, boy, it, it'll be a short off season with, uh, again, with, with how quickly these 185 days will probably feel and how fast they'll go. Yeah, no kidding. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for, for joining me every week for your contributions and for, uh, you know, yeah. entertaining the, entertaining the listeners all these weeks. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, look, and, and same to you, certainly, um, all, all the work that you put in during the year going to different games and, and, and getting clips um, and overlaying music that we can't use over the highlights <laughs> of it. Um, but yeah, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll think of some, some bigger and better things that we can, we can start doing right for next season. We'll, yep. we'll think of, uh, I feel like we've gotten better every year. So um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll look forward to that. And, and again, thank you to all, all the listeners um who, who listen i think we're just under two thousand twitter followers so um we, we appreciate everyone uh coming along with us it's, it's a lot of fun yep i love it follow along on twitter and uh you know keep updated that's a wrap for the 2022 season but we will we will talk soon thank you very much everyone we'll see you in the 2023 football season all right there we go let's stop